if you are a high growth startup or an SEO firm period, uh, especially in the B2C space, do you, uh, do you have B2B clients actually, Eli, before I go too deep? I've had B2B clients and we'll, we'll get deep into this later, but I, this may be an unpopular opinion, but I think for most B2B companies, SEO is a complete waste of time. So maybe we'll save that for later. Yeah. I'd say it's more of a waste of time on average. I'd probably go with that, uh, but with you there. And yeah, overall, Eli, very well respected. It's done some great work uh, consulting for startups. I know you did a ton of work for a Y Combinator specifically. His book, Product-Led SEO, is, is a must read uh, and, and worth checking out for sure. Advises startups all the time on best practices from a search and growth standpoint. Uh, and yeah, overall, uh, a great mind has previously been on this program. Check out the other video as well. But thanks for coming back on, Eli. Good to be here. Thank you so much for having me again. I really enjoyed the last time we did this. The uh, the ambiance was a little bit better than sitting on, <laughs> on, on a computer. <laughs> nice. Well, you got a green screen. Maybe we can kind of like, or you look like you're on a green screen. Maybe we can just superimpose you back there. Back in the beautiful <laughs> San Diego offices. Yes, exactly. Well, remote work has, has changed things a little bit, but maybe uh, we'll do that again sometime in the future. Um, but yeah, in that inter it, as a leading into into that first world is changing a little bit. Hopefully, we're past the COVID conversation at least a little bit. Uh, the new world we're in, in terms of the economy, is not as exciting for many startups as you're well aware. A lot of VC companies are cutting back on budgets, extending their one rate, trying to get to that next round as kind of valuations have compressed. I'm wondering if you've seen this inform. SEO at all, or would you advise startups think about SEO any differently, given this and this overall more lean environment for, for them? Yeah, I, so I, I think this is like a really interesting time because you have some startups where they haven't necessarily hit the right phase in their runway where they're nervous. So they may have money in the bank, but now they suddenly want to slow down the burn. You know, unjustifiably, they want to tighten marketing. And then you have other startups who just got funded and it's like, you know, 2000 for them, like the year 2000, and they just want to spend <laughs> on everything and make parties. And then you have like big companies who are, they're, they're not necessarily losing revenue just yet, but they're panicking and doing huge layoffs. So there's a lot of that going on. And I'm having like a lot of interesting conversations with, you know, current clients, prospective clients. There's, there's fear. And I, I don't know that the fear is justified when it comes to SEO because SEO is the long game. It's a, it's, you know, a long, long bet. And this is when you make long bets. Like maybe this isn't when like you, you know, break ground on a new building or a new campus because you don't know what that will be like in five years, but SEO is a 12 month. It's an 18 month effort and you're not, it's an investment. It's not free at all. Like some people think, however, it's not that expensive compared to other channels if you do this right and you, if you focus on the right ROI. One thing we've had a conversation about previously is that many startups should not do SEO at all, right? I know that's something you say very frequently to your people who come to you. You're often telling them not to do it. I, I don't know if that ever fact would factor into this kind of consideration, uh, but maybe those are smaller, earlier stage companies that maybe have less runway and are a little more panicky right now. I, I mean, I, I think a lot of startups should not do SEO. And they, there's three primary reasons that always come up. One is product market fit. Startups pivot so often. Again, depending on the stage, but even later stage startups that have raised you know, see, a decent money, you know, maybe a Series A, are still going to end up pivoting when it comes to like where they're going to find real revenue and how they're going to focus their company. So if you haven't found product market fit, why would you build an, a marketing channel based on a product market fit that's sort of on quicksand? So like, that's the biggest reason I think startups should invest in SEO. The second reason is I don't think it's a, the right channel for where they are you know, in, it's, uh, in the growth of their company. They need to drive revenue. They need to drive, or if not revenue, users and show that they have traction. SEO does not show traction. You look at like the growth of SEO of like most successful companies, it plods along and then it takes off. It's not linear. It's not like, you know, you get, yes, it, the growth rate is tremendous. You go from like one 
click to like two clicks, 100% growth. <laughs> That's great to show. If you just show the percentage, yeah. You show the percentages, but like it plods along. Like <laughs> month number six, like when I've worked with startups, month number six, they're like, you know, I really don't think this thing is going to work out. Like, you know, we're only at like 400 clicks per month. Like, is this a real channel? We're spending tens of thousands of dollars per month on it. And then month number 18, they're like speaking at conferences about the SEO thing they invented. So <laughs> that, that I, when it comes to startups, like they don't have that amount of time. They need to show traction and they need to get, you know, returns on their investment. So I, I think that startups should do paid marketing first because it is something that you can learn very quickly. Like you find the right thing and you're driving acquisition really quick and you can learn, you can test and learn, you know, in, in a day. Whereas an SEO, I don't know if people talk about this SEO testing. Most of this SEO testing is, is total garbage because is, there's not enough traffic. There's not enough data on anything. Whereas with paid, you can certainly test very quickly if you have budget. And then the third reason I really don't think you know, startups should focus on SEO is because they need to focus. So SEO is a channel that I don't think you could just you know half invest in it where you have a person that thinks about it an hour a day or an hour a week. You want to do this right. You want to build a channel. I mean, I wrote my book, Product Led SEO, which is really like you're focusing on as a product. This is a real channel for you. And taking away that focus from something else that's working doesn't make any sense. So invest in it when you have that ability to focus, not just because you think you need to. And I think that's the biggest reason that startups want to do SEO is like, okay, my investors just gave me, you know, a big check. Let me do all the things I'm supposed to do. <laughs> I'm supposed to hire like an HR leader. I'm supposed to hire an SEO person. Like challenge that. Do you really need to? Why do you need to have SEO? And if you can't answer that, then you don't need it. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I agree with you completely. And one of the uh, paid often indirectly will kind of help give you some momentum. Product market fit also in terms of initial link traction to shorten that t timeline very often. Um, so it just makes a ton of sense to wait until you're ready for that. Yeah. On, on a startup standpoint and kind of in that in, the, in that mode, I, in hearing some of the things you talk about, was curious how you how and if you ever kind of help build ROI models for startups, you talked about that timeline. Do you do that? What does that look like in, in your universe? So I think in general, ROI models for SEO are very hard to build because you don't really have any of the variables that you can build into an actual model. So with, let's say, paid traffic, you can have some of those variables. You can say, well, I'm going to pay this amount per click. So then you start getting closer to what your, your investment is and what your cost is. This is what I'm expecting from a conversion standpoint. So now you get close or a click to conversion standpoint. So you get closer to your engagement. And then you can start working on some of that, those improvements and the you know, conversion rate optimization. When it comes to SEO, it's impossible to predict how much traffic you will have. You can predict the size of your market and what you want to chip into, but you're, it's impossible. I think it's absolutely impossible to really say this is how much traffic I'm going to get. And I know like, you know, I've been doing SEO for a long time as you have. They used to have these click curve models where they would say, well, for position number one, you get like 42% click through rate. So it starts like this. You go like, this is the keyword. It gets 10,000 in monthly searches. And then because I'm going to definitely be number one for this keyword, I'm going to get 42% of those clicks. And then from there, there's my conversion rate. So here, boss, this is my estimate of how the search engine channel is going to pay off for me. So first, the, the biggest challenge is none of those monthly search volumes are accurate. I've never, ever seen any of those estimates be even close to accurate because you're not including the tail. You know, I worked with some brands. There's some of the largest brands in the internet where their, their brand is the, cert, the, is the biggest keyword in the space. So I've had the advantage of like looking at their Google search console, which is only one search engine. There are other search engines that people use, not a ton of people, but they use them. So you can look at Google search console, how many people search that keyword, and then look at any of the tools, and I've never seen them align, not with any of the brands that I've worked with. So those search volumes are not accurate. So let's start there. Those numbers aren't accurate. Then you've got these click curves, which are also completely inaccurate. I've seen position ones get click through rates of 5%. And I've seen position ones, they've clicked through rates of 90%. So your range will be 5 to 90% and you're picking 42% just because. And then the last piece is that you have no idea how that's going to fluctuate over time. So you may get to, you know, you may be at position three, you may be at position one, you may fall off the page. Like you have no way to control it. I love having these conversations 
with people where their SEO objective is to move up positions. Right now, I'm position number seven. My uh, my OKR for the rest of this year is I want to get to position three. Like, well, you already have every backlink you can get. You've done all the internal linking you can. You've stuffed all your keywords in. Which lever do you think you're going to push really hard on that's going to move you up four positions? It's completely out of control. So when it comes to ROI modeling for SEO, I don't see an ROI model that you can even do. But when I do have to do this ROI model, I'm, we make up numbers and we say, well, how many people do you think are searching your product per month? If they don't have a number there, so then already it falls off. They're like, well, no one really searches it because they don't know it exists. Good. No ROI model. That's, that's the startup challenge. The demand hasn't been created. It falls off. Now, let's say we can come up with some sort of proxy. This is how many people are searching for my product because my competitors are doing it. Now we can start proxying into an ROI model. And then we can say, well, you'll have to create this amount of content. Con good content will cost you $1,000 per piece of content. You'll need to do this sort of effort to build links. And the links will take you many months to acquire. And you know, at the end, we're talking you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of investment. What do you think you can generate from that? And then when they say, well, I'm not really sure, then we can say, what if you put that exam with that same $100,000 into paid marketing, what would you generate? And we're like, well, I would return one and a half times. Good, put the money there, right? So like, that's the way I'll do that ROI model. Now, when it comes to larger public companies, which is who I love working with, they don't care about ROI models. I say, what are you looking for from SEO? And it's basically, I'd like to spend this million dollars I have right here. Will it work out for me? I don't know, I'll find <laughs> out at the end. And if it doesn't, you know, the, half the team that's worked on this has probably gone on to other jobs, so no one's even going to ask about ROI. <laughs> so that's why I love public companies. There was, a, you know, I was once talking to a, you know, Fortune, I don't know, let's say 50 company that had spent a million dollars per year on link building, and they were trying to figure out if those links worked out. And they did this for five years. Like for five years, they had no idea whether a million dollars per year even returned any ROI on link building. They were trying to decide whether to keep their link building agency. So that's great. Startups, they cannot do that. Someone would definitely get fired. That makes complete complete sense. I mean, for startups, especially as you talked about with like product market fit and the like, and some people are creating demand. One thing we do do in our modeling, I agree that it's never accurate. We at least try to be directionally positioning, positioning in that direction. We're, we're, you are using HRS traffic values and things like that. But if you're a startup and you're creating demand is by nature, no one has done what you're doing. So you're using someone else's paid paid numbers. We know those are never accurate, even more so than like if I'm doing a flight company ROI model, probably relatively predictable because that's a very experienced market. So it's, it's a difficult behavior to do. Um, but one of the things you make me think on the end of that, too. I don't know if you ever saw the end of uh, every company's mileage may vary what that link outcome was. I've seen your recent comments on links in some ways. Uh, so was the answer no, they didn't see correlation? Or what was the what happened at, on the end of that? I think it's impossible to correlate. So I, I just had a, a recent conversation with a, another company that spent, I think, millions of dollars on links. And they also spend millions of dollars on commercials during football games. So there's no vacuum. So they found correlation that they think works for links. But at the same time, you can't take away all this other brand value. So what Google's looking for, or any search engine is looking for with links, is they're looking for brand authority. So links sort of like, well, if everyone in your you know, category links to you, then you must be an authority. But football ads do the same thing billboards do the same thing. So Google's just looking to replicate that. It's hard to say that what would happen without the links. So I think there are a lot of companies that don't do any link building that do just fine. And again, I, I, my sentiment is probably you don't need it. Google has done you know 22 years of spam detection to try to eliminate the impact of people buying their way to success. I know it still works, but they're trying to stop that. So I think it'd be okay for people not to build links. That being said, instead they should build PR, right? I think they should do the things that brands do, which is get articles talking about the things they do, get articles praising their leaders, get articles praising their products, have things from their customers that build that brand. Some of those will be links that will be counted in the algorithm. Some of those will be links that will not be counted in the algorithm. But regardless, if they're the, it's the right content, it's things that people read. 
and will say, well, I've read this article about your amazing product. I didn't click the link, but then I went and searched it and I found you on search engines. I may even click your paid ad, but like that's the value of it. So did you, should you spend a thousand dollars on a DA 80 link? <laughs> no. <laughs> should you spend a thousand dollars on a DA 80 site that hundreds of people read per day? Yes. Right. So that's the way I would calculate it. Yeah. Makes sense uh, completely. And we're, yeah, our current mindset, which you might have seen, is like still believing in the value of links, but we are realizing just from a modeling standpoint, to your point, a lot of like you can get that same behavior. You can get quality links by better focusing on your website, your content, real PR activity. It's just like a, that's sort of where our mindset is now is we did manual outreach for a long ass time. It was just that it just feels like a better ROI and maybe that other stuff will work, but you'll eventually lose to the people that are focusing on the right things where you can get more out of it than just spending a thousand dollars for the link in isolation. Right. And, and the, the focus is wrong. And I know that, you know, maybe some people will challenge this, but at least I can speak with the data here. The focus is always on this DA. And like, obviously we all get these emails trying to people trying to sell these guest posts and it's so focused on the domain DA's domain authority, domain authority, of the sites. Like I can get you a link on, um, you know, all these sites that I've been able to hack and they're high DA. Well, first of all, they're hacked pages and no one search engines are never going to see. So it doesn't even matter. So great. You got a link on, I don't know, time.com DA 80, but it's on a hacked page that no one's ever going to see. Second, <laughs> I've been able to get really good links on authoritative sites and seen them do nothing. So when I was at SurveyMonkey, on I think two or three occasions, we got links from whitehouse.gov. One of the times was because we did a survey, this one I remember distinctly, we did a survey that said something positive about Trump. Uh, this might've been when Obama was there, something positive about the, the White House, whoever was in the government, and they linked to it. And they linked to the survey page. And then what I did was I, I pulled links from that page over to other pages and it did absolutely nothing. No positions changed, no traffic changed, nothing happened. The second time we did a survey that may have been positive about Trump and the, chain, the commerce, commerce department, whatever it's called, whatever, one of those cabinet positions on business, they ripped off the entire blog post with all the links in it and they posted it on the whitehouse.gov. Like just a survey monkey blog post was on whitehouse.gov. And there were tons of links in it and not a single one of those pages, like anything happened, no more traffic, no more movement. They were on tail terms. We should have seen impact. So I don't know what the White House's DA is. Maybe it's DA 100 or something. <laughs> well, just DA doesn't matter. No one goes to the White House as a source of news and Google knows that. So they're not looking at that as a metric. They're looking at, well, how authoritative is the White House on survey products? Not. So therefore it doesn't count for anything. Yeah, makes sense. And something I've seen in that lens very often too, is you'll see those big sites like .edu's or whatever, and you'll get a link technically, but maybe it's like orphaned or it's like for some organization, uh, some organization running club that is not linked to anywhere on the main site. And I just doubt that passes the same value, even though it's technically nested under the same thing. Um, yeah. Well, I just want to, I have one, one counter thing I want to add to this because I know this is the business you're in and, and I, I want to make sure that there is one other value add from these kinds of links that even if it doesn't help for SEO, there's logos. So say you could get a link from time and it's not on a hacked page, but it's on a, it's an article no one reads. You technically could put that logo on your website and say, as quoted by time. So when you're buying the effort around the link and you're investing an in effort around the link, maybe Google doesn't like it. Maybe users never read it, but you now get that logo. So when you're assessing, should I spend $10,000 to have an article placed in time, don't just say, well, oh, it's DA 80 or DA 90. And I could do, you know, I don't know, five DA 10s instead. It's really, what's the value of putting Times logo? What's the value of putting Inc's logo or Forbes logo on my site? If there's value in it, then attribute that value to investment too. And not just, again, I think people make a huge mistake and they only focus on domain authority. And I don't even know if they still do this because I haven't done link building so long, but like, follow versus no follow like every time i ever tested follow versus no follow google follows like google and people still do this follow versus no follow on their sites when they have links but google doesn't need humans to be like search engine with your really intelligent algorithms don't trust this link because i'm telling you not to google will say well thank you for letting us know we'll we'll decide on our own. <laughs> 
Yeah, some of the I don't do this. We we do all earn now. I mean, we do some digital PR for the right kind of companies that probably are doing ads like that and finance for the most part. But uh, I've seen sophisticated players will look at traffic. So to your point, which you exactly said, they'll evaluate the topic industry and then is it generating traffic according to Ahrefs or Google? That probably is a signal. It's not a complete uh, dumpster fire and maybe could pass something. Um, doesn't mean you should still do that. I, I think we can better spend our time and effort. Earned. I'm yeah, all about yeah. earned. I like what you, I like what you did. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, shifting gears, uh, you've on controversial SEO things. You mentioned you don't do technical SEO audits and you rarely see technical convert to ROI. Maybe touch on that a little bit. And then like, Given that you're still a growth advisor, you're telling people a lot of it just not to do SEO. You don't do much modeling. It sounds like. What does your advisory consist of? What are what are people learning from from Eli? <laughs> yeah, so let's talk about technical SEO for a minute. I my experience on on the technical SEO audits is that one I've received many of them, and the best one I ever received was from Bill Slosky when I was at at SurveyMonkey. The uh, someone on my team. He really wants to see what a Bill Slosky audit looked like. So we got budget and we had Bill do an audit just for us just so we could see what that Bill Slosky audit looked like. And then, you know, we got to spend a bunch of time with him as he gave us the audit. And there were things that we could or couldn't fix. And obviously they, you know, Bill was the greatest and he found problems and some of the problems we fixed and it didn't move any needles. Some of the problems were too big to fix and they weren't worth investing in. And some of the things were like, when we said, should we fix it? He's like, yeah probably not right so that's that was my experience with audits is that there isn't always a so what so i'm i'm perfect on seo does that really matter for traffic on the flip side you know when i started consulting and still will i have a full-time job the main thing i did was audits for other people they were looking like how do i improve my site and you give an audit it's just like a readout it's like you've gone to the doctor and the doctor's like well you need to stop eating so much meat and you, you know you need to run you're like thank you i'll see you next year and you're probably going to say the same thing and that's what i found out happen with audits, which is you give this readout, but unless someone's actively looking to fix that part of the site, they're not going to fix it. So now they have a, you know, a health assessment that does, goes nowhere. Further than that, that I, I think a lot of audits lately, probably the last few years, focus too much on page speed. And again, that's not something that SEO teams even have impact on. Like They're not going to be able to go to the team that buys the data centers and you know, influence them to spend more money on that. And if they did, they would really owe that team you know, some sort of ROI, which there isn't. They couldn't say, well, you spent millions of dollars on making the site faster, and here's what happened. Because probably nothing will happen unless the site is super slow. Probably nothing will happen. So that's why I don't typically do audits, because it's not a good use of my time, not a good use of the company's time. And in general, I found that for the most part, the technical SEO things you're going to find aren't really going to move the needle if you're proactively finding them. On the flip side, of course, if a company comes to me and says, well, we launched you know, this entire site in Japanese, but we've got no traffic, then you could audit the Japanese site and say, what, what went wrong? Did you forget to like unblock the robots? Is the canonical messed up? Are, are using you know, on-the-fly translation? So you think you're in Japanese, but you're actually in English when Googlebot comes? Like, those are, that, then you can do a specified audit to find really issues with something that you want to fix. But to just say, I'm going to like take a, you know, a very high level view and look at all these things on a list and then read back to you all the things you need to fix, I haven't found that to be necessarily helpful. From an advisory standpoint, most of the companies I speak with, they're actually looking to create an SEO channel. They were usually over-indexed on paid or direct. And they don't know where to drive SEO from, or they're driving SEO and they don't know where to invest. So that what I'll typically do is work with the product team to understand where the investment should be made in SEO. And then essentially the engineers and the product team are building that. And again, that's where I focus on product-led SEO. What is the product they should create? How are they going to create that? And which product should they choose? And that's, you know, my favorite thing about SEO is you can't really do an A-B test on products. You can't, you know, half-ass build a lot of different stuff. You have to really go all in. And, you know, I can work with them on figuring out which one they should go all in on. Got it. That makes sense. So just overarching strategy in terms of that philosophy and 
and what have you as compared to technical. And I, I, I'm generally with you. I mean, something we've gotten stuck on over time is we do have a technical SEO team. To, I even gave it that word. I was like, this doesn't even make sense. I don't even really believe in it in that way. And found it kind of like difficult to consistently f- find deliverables that we knew moved the needle. And we finally evolved to like, at least advising on bottom funnel. It's essentially just content advisory of like bottom funnel pages and low performing content audits or cutting pages very clearly that aren't doing anything or updating them. Uh, but not the like s- stuff you're talking about, which I would generally agree with like site speed. I mean, it doesn't hurt to have a fast site, but going from a B plus to an A plus probably is not going to be a major win for you. Yeah. And, and like a lot of th- again, things that uh, audits will focus on, you haven't used your keyword enough. Those things don't matter anymore. You know, the, I forget this, the percentage, but let's, let's say it's 90% of all websites in the world don't do SEO. That's just probably a fact. And included in in those websites that don't do SEO are like, you know, the parliaments of major countries around the world, government agencies, universities, like how many universities are going to have an SEO team doing their SEO? So within that, search engines, Google in particular, needs to understand, well, how do we surface that content? How do we match users that are looking for how to pay their taxes with the IRS? So I don't know if the IRS does SEO or not. Um, they can use a lot of help with a lot of stuff. They should fix that stuff first <laughs> before they do SEO. But, but like users want to know, like, what is this form I got? And they Google it. And they don't want to find, I don't know, some sort of shady site that's going to tell them the wrong thing, take credit card information. Google wants to bring them to the IRS. So how does Google make that match to say you look for something that you need government information or COVID? I think COVID is a great example where most COVID searches landed on the right place, like government websites reputable health sites like you know hospitals not for-profit sites how do they understand that if those sites are not doing seo and i think that's the thing to understand about google is that they can do all of this ai and deep learning that you don't need to use your keyword the first in the first six characters in the title tag and you don't need to use your keyword 18 times in a piece of content you don't you need to use an image alt tag to make sure they understand the image like google can do all that because they have to account for Again, let's say it's even 70% of websites in the world don't do SEO. They need to account for all that and not give an edge to um, the health site that figured out how to hire the smartest SEO. (laughs) Yeah, agreed. I mean, our guidance to our team very often is like A plus SEO is bad SEO, actually. It's like B plus, A minus, more focus on creativity and the content quality, which will always sort of conflict with what used to be best practice in, in those things will generally uh, perform best over time and uh, completely agree that Google tends to figure this stuff out for sure. Yeah. Actually, I have a a great story there, which is, uh, I'm going to change the name of the agency. Someone reached out to me from on LinkedIn from a a government agency affiliated with the NIH and for a specific disease, I'll change it to, to kidneys. So there's like a kidney website put out by the NIH, like to understand all the kidney diseases. And this person reached out to me and she was panicked because her boss, who was like the head of web for the kidneys, said they got an email from an agency saying that they have negative SEO and it needs to be fixed. And they were panicking. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you are the NIH. Google knows that you need to rank on kidney related searches. No negative SEO is going to take that away. And if it does, it will disappear really quickly. Like there's so much of this bad stuff out there. And I, I couldn't believe an agency actually got that far to make someone in a government agency panic. But that's the way it is. Like Google will fix that. Like, you know, they look if bad. It's, if, it, if it's not yeah. the government, if, if it's the government, I, I think it'll take a few hours, maybe a day. If it's not the government, maybe it'll take a few weeks. But these hacks and loopholes don't exist for that long anymore. Yeah. It's it, like those kind of spaces, coronavirus health, health like in some ways, like, they end up embarrassed <laughs> and they got to figure that stuff out. Like if, if you can't find the NIH for that kind of stuff, that's not a good look for them eventually. Right. And it's algorithmic. It's not manual. So the algorithms are accounting for all this stuff. So when you think about that, like how does an algorithm understand that uh, you're in Canada and you need to find the Canadian version of the NIH? Well, do you think about those signals and that's what that's the way we need to do SEO. Like what sort of signals do you need to put in? Not that like someone at Google says, all right, I'm going to make a spreadsheet of all the government authoritative government websites for each disease or each 
you know, need, government need. And then this is what we're going to rank number one for the queries we couldn't even know. So like when you take that step back and say, well, how does Google do that? When it comes to sports, how does Google know which is the sports team and which is the blog about the sports team? Like these are the things that we need to understand when you're doing better SEO, because that's what the user's looking for. The user's looking to understand that information and they're not looking for the affiliate site. You know, when it comes to diamonds and someone's looking to score diamonds, like how does Google make sure that whatever there's an organization that does that, you're finding information from them versus the affiliate site that is representative of a jewelry store? Yeah, makes sense completely. Well, uh, yeah, transitioning from that, that idea, uh, a quote I saw you share on LinkedIn recently, and also people should follow you on LinkedIn, you're a good follow there, um, for sure. Also, you probably share this on Twitter, also a good follow. But anyways, you said, if anyone can replicate your SEO strategy in quotes, by improving on your content and links, dot, 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 you don't have a strategy. What did you mean by that? What's kind of the origin behind that quote as well? I, I was curious. So the origin is in many conversations I have with prospective companies that I want to work with is they say, my competitor is doing this. I need to do it better. And that's not a good basis. If the only reason you exist is to be better than your competitor, then your competitor is going to look at you and be better than you. And then you're in this cycle and no one's really differentiated. And I find very often when it comes to SEO, and this is you know based on tools, companies look at who their competitors are and just try to out SEO them. So you have like in Ahrefs and SEMrush, you have your content gap tools, which tell you this is what your competitor does, but this is what you do. Well, what if you do the exact same thing as your competitor, but you're better at providing that service? Why would you go into that gap? Go exactly where your competitors and write that better content. So I would never base a strategy on, I'm existing only because my competitor is bad at doing this and I'm going to do it first and hope that they don't notice and catch up to me. So, you know, I, I think like this comes up over and over again when it comes to people doing SEO, because again, they're basing it on the competitor. A great example, and I this one I've heard a few times from financial services companies is that were companies within finance. They look at some of the leaders within finance, let's say NerdWallet, and they say, well, NerdWallet has no idea that they can do credit card content like this, and I'm going to do it so much better, and they're buying content here, and I'm going to buy content better. I've, I don't recall the exact numbers fairly recently I heard this, but NerdWallet is spending, I think, hundreds of thousands of dollars on content per month in-house. They have hundreds of writers in-house writing that content. So if you can do that, if you have the budget to do that, so first of all, you now have to match the output that NerdWallet is doing. And second, you have to catch up on the 10 years they've already done it. So if you want to compete against NerdWallet, you don't want to be a better NerdWallet. You want to be a better you, whatever it is. So that's when it comes to SEO. And again, when if, you get, if you're a startup and you had an investment thesis that someone gave you money for, build your SEO around that thesis, not your, your SEO around, well, NerdWallet did this, so I'm going to do it better. <laughs> Another one I saw is within strictly finance, there's you know the stock space, like where you can do a lot around stock investing. And there, you know, arguably, there are opportunities to do better SEO within stock investing. So one I've heard frequently is, well, Motley Fool, fool.com, they don't do a great job. I'm going to do a far better job. So I recently heard, I think it's Allie Berry. She's at, at Motley Fool. She spoke at a SEMrush conference. And I, the number of, con the pieces of content they produce per day, I think was in the hundreds, maybe 200 pieces of content per day. So Fool is producing 200 pieces of content per day. Whoever the people I were talking to, they thought that content wasn't great. Fine, that's their opinion. But again, if you're going to out-compete Fool, you now need to produce 200 pieces of content per day, which is not cheap and catch up in the 20 years that Fool has been doing that. So I think, again, whatever business you want to be in, your starting point shouldn't be my competitors do X and I'm just going to do X plus plus. No, your competitors do X. I've done my research and I know that my customers want Y and I'm going to be the best at Y until no one even can catch me because I'm the best at Y. And then the entire industry will pivot. In my book, I talked a lot about Zillow because I think Zillow is my favorite example of product-led SEO. Zillow recognized an opportunity in what in real estate and that people wanted to know the valuations of houses. The only way to find the valuation at the time Zillow created this product was to go to government offices. And I think you had to physically go and look at the past tax records. You, there was, the governments weren't online. The, these are county courthouses. They weren't online. 
There was no way to find out like what a house was worth. And on top of that, you only found out what the government assessed the price of the house at. You didn't know whether that assessment was accurate. So what Zillow did was they pulled all that government information and they created a product around it to assess like, again, is it accurate? What are the recent sales? And that's the Zestimate. And now if you look for an address anywhere in America, they're number one. They're higher than Google Maps. They're higher than MapQuest at the time was there, right? So like that's a product. They've created a mode around it. They understand what people wanted. They didn't just, and funny enough, when Zillow was created, the way they monetized was with mortgage leads and with real estate leads. So they didn't just create a better mortgage lead website with using the word mortgage loan, you know, and refinance six more times than their competitor who was probably Quicken at the time. That's not what they did. They built a real product. They differentiated and essentially created an entire new search category that did not exist before that. So that was that was the you know point of my comment on LinkedIn that it really I find a lot of companies they're starting their SEO with like these are the keywords my competitors are ranking on I I'm better I should rank on them too instead of this is what I produce this is the kind of content I want these are the users I want I don't really care what my competitors do because I'm better at per- connecting with my users than them makes complete sense so I mean this is a nice I feel like it's coming full circle to also your advisory practice I'm imagining like in my head. Uh, which makes complete sense. You're trying to get like, there's that conversation where ironically we are, we're very often in where we're like creating the content and SEO stuff and like keyword research and all that. Still, of course, that needs to be done as a value part of the strategy, but you're essentially like trying to get multiple steps back before that conversation where product is happening, where in some ways, if the product or, that like deeper strategy lens is not being applied, what's done further down might be too late or lower ROI or ineffective. Is that a fair characterization? Characterization? Am I framing that correctly? Yeah. Yes, totally. And I, I sort of landed on this, you know, early on in my consulting when I, w- I was talking to a friend of mine who was working at an insurance startup. And insurance is, you know, a great space. You ever think about like, you know, how much money is spent on insurance on, you know, again, TV ads. There's a lot of switching. It's a great place to make money and build affiliate sites and and do, again, a lot there. So this company raised a lot of money and they were doing something in insurance and they want to put all their money in SEO. And I point, this is car insurance, and I pointed out that Geico's website is older than Google's website. Progressive's website is older than Google's website. So if you look (laughs) at the word car insurance on Google, Geico is not, go- I don't know what's number one, but like the companies we know, State Farm, Geico, Progressive, they're not just going to fall out of the index because someone has a new innovation on insurance. You're not going to rank on car insurance. 100%, I put you know a huge bet on no startup is going to rank on car insurance unless Geico, Progressive, State Farm, and all the insurance companies just forget to register their domain names or Google just hates them and just wants to upset the entire market. So if you're looking to drive traffic, in the car insurance vertical, the word car insurance and the word auto insurance and all those other synonyms is not where I'd put any effort. You want to find some other differentiation around, you know, uh, safe driver car insurance. Again, it's not not really long tail. You want to build a product around it. But to say, oh, I've done my keyword research and the word I need to use is car insurance. And here's my click curve and my analysis of how I'm going to do that. I really don't think a startup is going to make it in the first two pages for the word car insurance. Again, if Google wants to rank all the actual insurance companies there and not affiliates and not tangential products. Yeah, it makes complete sense. And it sort of goes back to that advertising as well. Like, I mean, in some way, I often say to people in finance space, uh, I've said to someone who was trying to rank for home insurance, I'm like, you're never going to rank for this until you actually start advertising on TV in some ways because you're not Geico or I don't know who's most relevant for home insurance. They're a public company, this company, but they're still not uh, notable like those people. So it's not going to change. Um, they do have a good product. Hopefully they'll eventually get there. Uh, and maybe advertising might be part of that conversation, but um, I, I like that thought process. So related lens, another uh, Eliism. Uh, I don't know if I can use that word. Using competitors, like <laughs> using competitors as the basis for your SEO strategy makes a huge assumption that your competitors have an SEO strategy. Sort of feels in the same kind of like ballpark. What was the 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 basis of of that one? So again, the same conversations. 
with you know, prospective clients where they, they say, well, my competitor is doing this and I want to do this too. And the story I always like to tell there was these two things from SurveyMonkey. One is when I was at SurveyMonkey, we did a number of acquisitions and we acquired other survey companies. And you know, on the, I was on the SEO side and I did the due diligence on SEO. And I thought like these companies we acquired were doing an amazing job and they're ranking on keywords and they're you know, doing great stuff. And I wanted to understand what they did. And then we'd get their search console and analytics and I'd get to meet the employees and they had no idea what I was talking about. What I thought <laughs> is like a brilliant strategy. It wasn't even something they noticed. It was you know, a complete accident. Uh, you know, links they had gotten that I was like, well, how did they get that link? You know, that amazing blogger linked to them. They didn't even know they had it, right? So you, whenever you do that, you're basing an assumption on, it was even in the strategy. It was even in you know, something they did intentionally. And the second thing is another survey monkey thing. I, um, when I was at SurveyMonkey, we competed against Qualtrics and, you know, SurveyMonkey still competes against Qualtrics. And there's a, you know, there was someone there who was leading SEO who I looked up to and he very respected and did a great job around SEO. And I think, you know, a lot of people listen to this podcast probably know who I'm talking about. I had so many conversations with him after we both left our prospective companies and we talked about SEO and how I tried to copy things that he didn't realize they had done. And he was copying things that they didn't i didn't realize i had done like what we again what we thought as strategies they're like wow like you know you as a competitor are doing something amazing i'm gonna outdo what you're doing i didn't even do it intentionally so it's just like great to have those conversations again goes back to the earlier point do seo for you like do a great thing for your business and don't base it on well i'm going to do it for my competitors because google's eventually going to catch up and realize that i'm just better one thing uh agree like or hopefully a decent an anecdote in that lens that I f find happens a lot is we look at our competitors and by nature, just like using keyword tools, we default to like the highest volume things. I've seen competitors, even to us, like would look, would create content on stuff that obviously shows up on our top pages. Almost, I, I would <laughs> say very frequently, whatever's top in like high search volume very often is the worst converting. So we naturally default to these things that can like pro are prominent, but very often aren't doing actually anything for the business to the exact structure you talked about. Um, it's kind of the under the surface stuff that very often converts the best. And because we just think a competitor ranks for it and it drives a lot of traffic, that that's the reason for what they've built. And uh, very often it's just not the case. Yeah, well, I push back against even using traffic as a metric. So there was a, a company I was working with. They were in a two-sided marketplace, buyers and sellers. They made all the money off the buyers. But all the traffic was in the sellers. So they created all this content around seller content because they used keyword research. And I'd say 80% of the organic traffic was coming into these widgets that would never convert. It was the wrong user. So that's why I always push back from like, are you basing everything around this SEO strategy of keyword research and I want users, but you, again, our first part of this conversation was ROI. Like there wasn't even ROI. It's not possible to do like any sort of ROI analysis because that user is just the wrong user. It's like, um, and I've seen this in, with international companies where they're driving a bunch of traffic. Like let's say you're an American company and create a lot of Spanish content and it, you're getting Spanish speakers that are not in America. You just, you cannot service people outside of the U.S. borders. So great. It's traffic and you got traffic from Mexico and Colombia and Argentina, but like doesn't do anything for you. So there has to be an ROI model. There has to be a funnel. There has to be a reason you're creating it for users and for profit unless, and again, the only exception to this is if you're media. So if you're media and you get paid on advertising and you know, impression advertising, get all the eyeballs you can. <laughs> but if you're actually trying to convert somebody to like download something or buy something or share something like it, it has to be part of a funnel. Yeah. Makes sense. One, one way we adapt those metrics is we look at traffic value. We look at traffic and we, then we create a relevancy score. So we get to know the business in month one and then we'll adjust those metrics to the best we can either up or down based on what we feel that is. Uh, so you don't just blindly look at traffic and traffic value and to your point, that's going to naturally default you to non-relevant stuff, especially as a startup very often who just doesn't even know or maybe just is figuring out their product market fit. Yep, exactly. Uh, so you 
I, I don't know if some of the this advice for your for your, for your clients in terms of replicating the competitors that's your strategy. I mean, you you gave a good example of Zillow there in terms of how they did it. I don't know if any others come top of mind of companies that went beyond. Oh, we're just going to do better content and links for for uh, ourselves in order to win. Like, what are what's another example of that? If you happen to have any, so this is my favorite example: Amazon. So Amazon crushes it on almost every single e-commerce search. And I don't think that's by accident because they, you know, I'm, I'm reading the new book on Amazon, Amazon Unbound, if anybody wants to read a great book on Amazon. So the guy that wrote it, wrote a book 10 years ago called The Everything Store about how Amazon became such a I've read that. great good. thing. Yeah. So he has got a new book that just came out called Amazon Unbound, which is how Amazon became like the biggest company in the world and Bezos, all that stuff. It's updated. So it goes all the way through like, his divorce and take going to space. It's fascinating. So Amazon wasn't the natural site to really own all things around e-commerce. Target, I mean, Walmart is bigger than Target, but even Target had more products in warehouses than Amazon. Walmart, of course, had more product, has more products than any you know, physical company in the entire world. Walmart could have won e-commerce. But I think Amazon approached SEO, and I, you know, I've talked to the Amazon SEO team years ago. But Amazon approached SEO from a very tactical aggregate structure rather than like, how do we build a site that's going to, or how do we build a page that's going to rank on iPhone 14? They built an entire site that will rank on everything possible because they built really good structure and really good architecture and really good ways of feeding in content. And so much of that site is around SEO. And if you don't think Amazon cares about SEO, just go look at the footer and look at the keywords they use to link to their, their sub brands. But you know, Amazon cares very much about SEO. And I, I could imagine they generate billions of dollars just from SEO. And that's and I think that is part of the strategy, whereas Walmart did not. And I had a little insight into how Walmart built the strategy around SEO, because I've I've worked with a number of Walmart employees who were, you know, worked on SEO there. But more than that, I had a friend. Uh, in the Bay Area, and, and she was a she had a PhD in literature or English or or something uh, related to writing. And her job was she worked at Walmart, and she managed a team that took product descriptions that came from manufacturers, and they bulked up those product descriptions with keywords. Like you know, we we thought we had this conversation of like, oh, you do SEO, I do SEO too. And then she explained her SEO job. Whereas Amazon was thinking about a high level, like how do you build the greatest website in the world for SEO. Walmart was keyword stuffing. So I think if you want to think about like, how do these strategies work? Like you have a real strategy, you know, you want to win something. It's not going to happen today. Like this was you know 10 years ago. Amazon did not own every e-commerce search then. Now they do right now. If anybody wants to really break into e-commerce, you have to knock aside Amazon. And, and that is, that is going to be way harder than it ever was. And Walmart could have been that site. And I'd say like Walmart's last gasp at this I don't know who remembers this, but Walmart partnered with Google and they had this Google Shopping Express where you could go onto essentially Google's Amazon and you would order stuff, e-commerce things, and it would come from Walmart would deliver it. This was even, I can't remember when they ended it. So if you think about like, you go to your, your Google Home device and you say, buy me this, Walmart would have been fulfilling that order. So this could have been like Google could have knocked aside Amazon. This is the last attempt, but you know Walmart itself couldn't get it together from a, a search standpoint. And you know I, I think that was the last attempt to really you know knock aside Amazon's dominance. So Amazon is totally dominant in everything related to e-commerce and not an accident. Yeah, they have a very good strong SEO team. Um, fun fact: I actually considered right before I started Siege, I was considering a job offer from Amazon. Oh, I hadn't got offered. Maybe they would have never offered me, but very strong SEO team um, and maybe stronger because I'm not on there, but I, who knows how that would have worked out in life. But um, yeah, that's a good one. Obviously, they think about search in and out uh, from from the start. And overall user experience, I feel like that echoes in all the things you say um, that maybe Walmart did not as much on the website. Like, probably more of an in-store experience as compared to the day of website experience that Amazon seems to be pretty good at. Yeah. I, I think another Walmart challenge that, that they had was in Amazon did not is Walmart was very hierarchical and very bureaucratic. So when it comes to SEO, you need to be able to move quickly. If like you see something broken, you need to fix it. I think at Walmart, a lot of decisions they made around web had to go up the line and go back to Bentonville and their headquarters. Like, should we change the website like this? Whereas Amazon had a very like, 
move fast, break things, and keep them working kind of approach to it. So that's the way their SEO worked. So whereas you know, you know, Walmart took them years to implement an SEO strategy, Amazon just did it. Makes sense. I mean, in looking at your two examples, Zillow and Amazon, some people that might listen to this just to like answer an objection you might hear in saying this, and of course, maybe this is what, why they're here. These are massive companies, of course, now, but maybe it's yeah, that's why. It, is there like a mid-size example of this or like how they should be thinking about the same lens beyond um, those two behemoths? So Zillow wasn't always a massive company. They were a startup. And they were funny, you know, they, Amazon, I mean, I don't know who's going to remember Amazon trying to raise money, you know, for most people who listen to this, Amazon has always existed, but Zillow did not always exist. I mean, Zillow is only, I think, 15 years old and they totally started as a startup. I, you know, another example uh, is a company that I, I actually had a role in com- helping them with their idea, which is Zapier. So a lot of people are familiar with Zapier. They built a product-led SEO strategy and that was my first attempt that I, I was introduced to them when I was you know, early at SurveyMonkey. And we brainstormed on ideas around SEO. At the time, they were creating content-led SEO. They, you know, one of the things I wanted to learn when I, I met with them was uh, how they created such a successful blog post about the top survey tools to use. And it was ranking on survey tools and bothered me while I was at SurveyMonkey. And we, together, we came up with this idea around pairing different tools and looking at like, how you could do like Salesforce and Gmail. And that created a new category for them, which, you know, as you can see, and you know, from their traffic drives a ton of value for them. So I think anyone could do it. I think, you know, you have to find, and I have a whole chapter in my book on this, your blue ocean SEO strategy. So your blue ocean is essentially a place that no one else is focusing on. And, you know, the word that people use in the very niche, narrow search world is zero search volume. So there's a lot of <laughs> content on zero search volume. These are things that the, the keyword tools tell you no one's searching, but then you create content and lots of people are searching. That's a blue ocean. So instead of like trying to invent blue ocean by looking at zero search volume, invent blue ocean by talking to users and saying, what is it that they're looking for? And what can I create? Again, like what Zillow did, like what Zapier did, what Amazon did, what can I create that people are looking for and they just can't find it? So the, the way I like to do this is I like to talk to users and just ask them what they're looking for. Uh, you can send a survey. Or a, you know, a great resource for this is Reddit and Quora. Just like kind of look at the conversations people have around challenges. Like we talked about finance earlier. What are the challenges people have around understanding stock prices? And how could you approach stock names from a different perspective that maybe Google Finance doesn't or Robinhood doesn't or Motley Fool doesn't? And then you're creating that product. Again, you need to validate that it's not just a single long commenter on Reddit. But that's the idea. And that's how you come up with the, your Blue Ocean effort. And then, you know, 10 years down the road, we're talking about you in a podcast and that's your moat. Your <laughs> but everyone starts there, right? So like it, Zillow, you know, thinking about what Zillow had to do to build Zillow, getting every county government in America to give them data, like Not yeah, easy. That, yeah. They, they had to know that was something people wanted. Yeah, or, uh, I mean, you essentially just answered one of the questions I was thinking about uh, asking you is like, oh, so you've got a background in surveying people. You mentioned those tools. SurveyMonkey is a good one. We use SurveyMonkey. Like, what are the other? Are is there anything other, like tactically about uh, surveying users from a search standpoint that you'd recommend to people? It's not. I, I don't even know if we'd use the word survey. So I, I think Talk one thing them, that's yeah. missing. Oh, yeah, exactly. Missing a lot within the SEO world and a lot within digital marketing in general is customer empathy, and you know just to. It, it is a, it's a buzzword, of course, customer empathy. I care so much about customers, but really like be in your customer's shoes and see if your customer would actually do that. So I think when it comes to like keywords, I would challenge many SEO people to find someone who even searches that keyword. Like, yes, you found it in a keyword research tool, but is that what a human is going to use to find what they're looking for? So you find that by finding actual customers. If it's not something you use yourself, then find people that will use that. And if you're creating something for Gen Z and you're not Gen Z, then you need to see what Gen Z does. You know, my one of the ways I learned this was I spent a couple of years living in Asia and I did it deliberately because I wanted to learn a completely new market and I didn't know anything. I had no preconceived notions. And it's fascinating to like see how people did things. And I, I try to adapt that to the way I do things now, which is don't make any assumptions, 
that just because a Q research tool told me or my own intuition or my client's intuition said it's going to be like this, look at customer data, talk to customers and see how they would do it. Because if you're building for them, then you need to build for them. Yeah, with you. I mean, I love the idea of, um, I believe, uh, Spark Toro's director of marketing. Uh, I forget her name off the top of my head, but she was actually Amanda. Amanda she's amazing. Um, she pushes a lot of user research in Earth philosophy. I mean, I, and one thing we tell our team to do is don't even like go to a keyword tool, like go from the understanding of what you've learned from listening to sales calls, form submits. Uh, if we don't get the clear ability to talk to users always in our discovery period, but as much info as we have, and then pretend you're that user doing searches without even touching a keyword tool. Like how would you search those problems um, is often our kind of like starting point. I, I think sometimes like that might not show any search volume, but that's the kind of stuff that converts very well, very often. And sometimes you'll, you'll find search volume too. <laughs> Just depends. Yeah, th that's customer empathy. Yeah. That is exactly you know what I'm referring to. It's like really be in the customer's shoes, because these you know keyword research tools are just kind of aggregating up things. You know, one thing that I, I want to dig into this more. I just noticed this the other day. If you ever look at people also ask the uh, when things are capitalized or misspelled, they're included as people also ask. So they're not sanitized search queries. So I was looking at Google's new phone, the Pixel Seven, and there was a people also ask, which is is the Pixel 7 good? And good is written in all capital letters. I think that's fascinating. Like to really, that's what real users are doing. Now you throw the word Pixel 7 into like your research tool. I don't think that would show up because it, again, it's sanitized and normalized and all that. Looking at people also ask, looking at suggested queries in their raw view is amazing. And that's where you get ideas. And, you know, looking at, again, again, going back to Pixel 7, maybe, you don't think safety around a cell phone is a is, there's query volume, but if you're saying is Pixel is the Pixel Seven going to give me cancer, and now you go and look at every cell phone and see there's that same people also ask, you just discovered an entire new search category which is how dangerous are cell phones. So I don't know how you monetize that. <laughs> I don't know what you would do with that. But again, that, that's the idea. You're using something that real users do, and I don't know. Maybe you're selling them headsets that take away any radiation whatever it is that you're doing using that to find out where real customers think rather than well this is the keyword and now i'm gonna really use that keyword as a slug and extend that with uh, pixel 7 price and pixel 7 specs and pixel 7 pictures but find something that real users want that no one else is doing love that insight yeah now i'm like wanting to do a lot of people also ask searches just, just to see what <laughs> see what's in, in that and I definitely have seen similar where it's just kind of like the mo sometimes completely non-useful they'll even repeat the same questions but variants of it and that's probably even an indication of sample size of these problems um that maybe a keyword tool won't always represent well this has been great eli thanks for coming on yeah everyone should definitely check out your book uh product led seo follow you on linkedin follow you on twitter great follows there for uh, uh growth and seo strategy advice for sure um yeah, anything we didn't leave you with or any, anything else you'd uh, recommend or tell people um, to to find you or what have you? Check out the book. Go into a lot more detail on it in the book. And then the only other thing I'd add is I talked a lot about what I do with companies. A new thing that I'm trying to understand a little bit more is how we can level up the actual employees. Like I love the conversation we had. Was it I don't know, two, three years ago in San Diego, and we talked about like how to expand on career. I think so many people within SEO, their careers are held back because of who they report to. They're not reporting to SEO leaders, they're reporting to marketing leaders who don't understand their role. So this new thing I've been doing is rather than just like working directly with companies and the company success, I'd love to work with like employees and help employees to level up. Like how does a SEO manager become an SEO director? And what do they need to do and how do they better position themselves? And of course, the company benefits because their employers are better. But I think that's something that I've noticed that is really lacking within digital marketing, that the best digital marketers are not reporting to the leaders that even understand what they do. So if I can help anybody. Please <laughs> yeah, I mean, that previous conversation, anyone in SEO 
like that really resonated. It was like one of our more popular conversations. Of course, people were trying to understand how their careers uh, continue is, is something everyone cares about. Uh, so that sounds like a great, great service you're providing. Um, well, great, Eli. I uh, appreciate you coming on. Really great to be here. Thank you for having me again. Of course.